Welcome back to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. Adam's here. Hello. I guess we wouldn't call it the Adam Savage Project if you weren't here, Adam. <laughs> I have. It's a prerequisite. Yeah, uh, Norm also Hello. is here. Hello, Norm. Uh, today we are talking about making things and where to find stuff. Because we talked about cardboard a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. which is an easy place to start if you don't if you don't have a lot of money for materials or whatever. Absolutely. But over the years, as Norm and I have built stuff, uh, we found that finding finding some stuff is really easy. You can just go to the hardware store and kind of look around. But sometimes when you need something specific, it's hard to find, even if you're in a big city like San Francisco. Absolutely. With a lot of like short stores and shops and stuff like that. So And a, a lot of... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, like one day, Norm and I spent literally 48 hours trying to find a six-inch piece of nichrome wire to build a heating element for a oh, MakerBot. Yeah. And it turns out nobody has nichrome wire anymore. You should have called me. I, if I had known you, I would have called you. I, I, I believe I've got a little stash right over... I, no. I'm not yeah. surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's it's And those things... It's funny because there's a, there's two things that happen. One is that some of those things, like nichrome wire, were never easy to find if you had to find one on the ground somewhere. Yeah. Um, but the internet has also made certain things much harder to find. Like it's drastically lowered the selection at Radio Shack. Mm -hmm. You know, and when what you need is a double pole, double throw, on off you know, two position toggle switch. That's going to be an esoteric electronics item. It's going to be much harder to find. Yeah. Well, there are a few good radio shacks left, in fairness. It's true. No, absolutely. The, the one by my house in Pacifica has a, I don't want to say it's a good selection, but it has a much better than average selection. And if you've ever been to the one in Sebastopol, it's amazing. No, really? it is. It is worth a trip. We should probably go up there and talk to them and do a video with those guys because it's 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 like it's like a Radio Shack plus plus. I had no at idea. the top of the top of the day. Well, it's by Make and all those guys, so they have ah, they have okay. a they have a pretty good built in audience there. Okay, so okay. there's a difference between wanting something immediately, needing it the day of, and it being difficult to find, and then something mostly. If, you know, you can find things on the internet if you search hard enough. And there, it's it can be very difficult to find. So there, I mean, there are whole different, there are whole categories of things that are, why things are difficult to find. Like yeah. you might want a certain type of toggle switch, but DigiKey doesn't necessarily list exactly how big that toggle switch is. I've ordered things that seemed like they were the right size and they've shown up and they were half the size I thought or right. double the size I thought. Yeah. Um, and that can be incredibly frustrating. Well, and the problem I have is a lot of times I'll know exactly what I want physically. I'll be able to describe it. But if you don't know that um, uh, it's a number three machine screw with a with a one eight thread, you're boned because you're never going to be able to figure out what it is. Not only are you boned, but when you are searching for something on the ground, and this happened to me constantly when I was a young maker, mm -hmm. I would go in and I'd go, hardware store guy would go, what do you need? So, well, I'm not really sure what I need. I need, yeah. I'm making this thing and I need a chrome ring. That's about 10 inches in diameter. Do you have something like that? <laughs> and he goes, well, what are you making? It's and then, like, then it's and just you got to pause and you got oh, how much do I tell? Okay, I'm making a spacesuit, and sometimes they'll even go, well, you can't make one of those with one of those, <laughs> or like what? And then other times they'll go, yeah, I don't think anyone makes anything like that. Yeah. And I think, why would you try and stop me? Yeah, if you don't have it, that is one. That's the only fact I need to know. But why are you going to try and inhibit my ability to find it anywhere else? And you get that a lot because because you give them that you you say what you're looking for, and then they kind of go hmm. Yeah, there's like a there's like a hmm. There's a up into the right look, and there's sometimes a chin stroke, and it's like and it's either. Yeah, go check out aisle 10 because that's his buddy's aisle and he's not going to have to bother with you at that point. Yes. Or it's it's a it's a pound sand basically. So so I mean there there are you know when you're looking for aesthetic things the places that you want to look are you want to browse hardware stores and you want to browse them even when you're not looking for things. Mm -hmm. Like that is actually a really key aspect. If you're a prop maker and a designer uh, for theater or for film like just knowing what's out there can help you tremendously in solving problems when something comes up. But that's on an aesthetic level. Yeah. And there are other places you can go for that, which are places like junkyards, um, auto pick and pull yards are great for for great aesthetic hardware. Explain what a pick and pull yard is. Uh, there's a bunch of them out here in the Bay Area, but it's basically a junkyard full of cars where they don't have parts for sale. You go in and yank the part you need from a car that's out there, and you bring it, and they're like, ah, eh, ten bucks. I mean, and everything is what you know what they decide to charge for it, and it's all 
yeah. as is. You yeah. know, there's no warranty on anything. But for fixing your car for 20 bucks, which I did for years, there's no better thing to do. Especially, yeah. you know, you don't have a too esoteric a model. Like I had a Volvo station wagon. There was always a couple of those on the lot. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great place to go look. Um, like I said, thrift stores, junkyards, swap meets. Um, but the real difficulty can be when you're looking for something really specific, like from a mechanical or electronic standpoint. That's when it becomes really hard for that beginning level of knowledge to shop on the small parts catalog online site because there's like, I need chain, I need small chain. Well, there's 85 kinds of small chain. Which right. one do you want? And you're like, I don't know. Right. Do you want do you want figure eight links? Do you want round links? Do you want oval links? Do you want square links? What, what, what exactly are you looking for? And, and that's the point at which I find getting human help is the, is the good thing. So that's when I go hit message boards and stuff like that. That's exactly right. And I actually, I just taught one of my kids to, whenever you can't figure out, like he was trying to make a, a multi-track recorder that he has work. And I was like, if you can't figure it out, type in the question you have and then type forum. Yeah. Yeah. And you will find people and literally you can find any, how the hell does this work? Will be an entry on one of those forums about that device. Oh yeah. Um, I will also say that um, there are a couple of great places to look for electronics parts where you can just learn about what they are, and that is the American Science and Surplus Catalog. Oh, okay. That's a, I've never I've never seen that before. Oh, I'll have to go check it this out. This is a great place. We should be linking to them right after this podcast. Um, American Science and Surplus. Their mothership is in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I have visited it many times, even long as as long ago as. 18 years ago. Um, and they get exactly what you'd imagine. They get surplus from military, engineering, and scientific industries, and they sell it for pennies on the dollar. Um, and so sometimes there's things in their catalog. Every time they have a catalog, something is in it. It's like, we don't know what this is, but it's this big, this long, and it's got a button and a plug. You you decide what you want to do with it. It's three dollars. Oh, I love this. I love yeah. that stuff because then somebody and, and then then there's a puzzle there too, yes. right? Because you get to figure out what it was for, and that's fantastic. Oh, so they'll sell they sell all kinds of great switches for. I mean, you know, there are certain kinds of switches like micro switches which are really quite expensive, about twelve bucks if you bought them from DigiKey. Whereas from American Science and Surplus, they may be only two or three dollars, and that makes a big difference oh, when yeah. you're building props for theater on a budget where your whole budget for a play is like hundred and thirty dollars. Well, of course, and and. And I mean, you're, if you're going to take it apart and use bits and pieces of it anyway, there's no reason to buy something new. Right. I mean, and exactly. You reuse something, recycle, man. Well, and that's actually where you really get to the heart of a thing that Make Magazine's been promoting, which is grab old electronics out of the garbage and desolder a bunch of crap off those boards because you can use it. Yeah. Get yourself a sorter, like a Sortimo sorter, mm -hmm. and sit there and put resistors in there, put switches, put AC adapters, put uh, power supplies, put uh, power supply couplers. All of that stuff, heat sinks, all of that stuff can will come in handy if what you're interested in is putting electronics together. Well, and, and I mean, it's not like you have to manually desolder everything. If you have a hot plate and a good pair of tweezers, you can literally just put the board on the plate heat it up to whatever temperature the solder is going to melt yes. at, and then just start plucking stuff off with the tweezers, and it'll take 15 or 20 minutes. I've never tried that, but I love well, that Well, we'll idea. do that. Let's do a video. That'll <laughs> totally. be fun. I will totally do that. Um, and then if you want to do stuff that maybe requires a little more chemistry, like vacuum forming and, and molding and making resins and stuff like that, like wh where, where do you go for that kind of stuff? Well, so vacuum forming is a really tricky thing because... It is the soul of the special effects industry. Mm -hmm. it's, everyone in special effects uses vacuum formers. I'm sorry, I'm a little No, no, forced. do you need some water or something? <clears throat> I'm good. You look like a man, not a little horse. <laughs> everybody, everybody in the effects industry uses uh, vacuum forming, but vacuum formers themselves, no one ever buys them in enough volume for any company to make them. So there just aren't really any out there. So it's something it's you scrabble hand. together? You, you really have to build your own. Now, I found... It's like a, a lightsaber. I found a YouTube... Yes. <laughs> your father didn't want me to give you this. I found a video on YouTube of a guy who designed a magnificent vacuum former, the total cost of which is under like $50. Wow. And what he did was he took a garbage can. Did he take a... It was effectively a garbage can... Is a metal garbage can or plastic garbage can? Actually, no. I'm not. I'm not even sure. I'm right about the garbage can part. He basically built a wooden box with a with a room heater at the bottom. Okay. And the top of the wooden the box was lined in tin foil, 
And then the top of the box was just big enough for the frame for his. Well, I should go back and explain vacuum forming plastic. This is, this is this, we're supposed to be here to ask these questions. Yeah, sorry. Vacuum about that. forming plastic is a method of taking a thermal plastic, which is a plastic that melts, it becomes soft when you heat it mm-hmm. and hard when it cools down. And all your plastic packaging, bubble packaging, is all vacuum. Is a thermal. You're plastic. saying blister pack, blister the pack. bane of our existence. Yes, is all that's all thermoform. Awesome. Now that's a thermal plastic, PET, PETG, something like that. Uh, and it, it, when you heat it up, it softens, and when it's no longer hot, it when it, it cools down and it hardens. So what you can do is you can make a form like a stormtrooper face, mm-hmm. and take white plastic, heat it up until it's soft, put it over that form, and then draw a vacuum underneath, and the plastic will adhere. Will not adhere. It will uh, uh, conform to the shape of the buck. The buck is what you form over. Okay. Now, vacuum former can be built with, you know, about $30 worth of wood and a shop vac. Um, heating element is always a difficult thing to solve. Some people actually make frames that they put in their oven. Okay. And they pull them out and mm-hmm. form with them. And that works just fine. It would make your oven smell a little funky. It, uh, no, actually, the, the plastic doesn't off-gas that badly. Thermal plastics are a pretty innocuous thing to work with. They're, okay. they're wonderful. And there's tons of tutorials online for people who've made their own vacuum formers. But this one method was beautiful because... Most vacuum formers involve a heating element that's up high, a frame that can go up to the heating element, mm-hmm. and then a vacuum plate where you put your box. So it's all mm-hmm. a one-stop operation. And my, I have two. They both work the same way. I heat the plastic up. It droops down. I can see it drooping. I can feel it getting soft. I put it, pull it down over the form, turn off the heater, turn on the vacuum. It sucks to the form. And I've made spaceships. I've made armor. I've made and all the, sorts of things. The strength of the vacuum determines the fidelity of the, the form. Absolutely. And you can also do things like you drill holes in your form for key details where you want to pull Pull the plastic mm. in. You dust your form with uh, 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 cornstarch in order to allow a micro layer so that the the air can move and pull the plastic tight around the thing. Oh, okay. Um, but nobody really. There are some commercial vacuum formers out there. They're usually for making things like blister pack, in which they're gargantuan well, and they uh, cost thousands of dollars. I mean, when we were at Tippett Studios, we he showed us his vacuum formers, and literally it was a like a shipping crate with a heater in the bottom yeah. and a vacuum and like it, I would have never known what it was if he hadn't said hey yeah here's where we do this exactly kind of stuff. and it's a it's so important for them they do animatronics with it oh, yeah. they do for so um I have uh I've built my own vacuum formers in the past I bought the one I currently have now which is a nice big 2 by 3 foot vacuum former um, was a kit, uh, a pl- set of plans that someone sold, and it was half built by someone. I bought it half built and completed the build. Okay. Um, and I put a really high quality vacuum in it. I put high quality air evacuation and uh, uh, filtration system. So it cost me a few thousand dollars to do that. It's a very robust machine. On the flip side, there's this YouTube video, which I will find the link so we can post yeah, we'll it. We'll post on it on testing, the site. Um, where it's literally a wooden box with tin foil and a heater at the bottom. And you just, the, the, when the form gets soft enough, when the plastic gets soft enough, you just lift it up and put it over here. And he's got a plate with a, with a vacuum, literally a vacuum, not even a shop vac, just a vacuum hooked up to it. The Dyson <laughs> vacs have a tremendous amount of suction. Oh, yeah. Um, and $50. He has a several thousand dollar piece of equipment, that's, and it works every bit as well. That's perfect. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and then, but but then, if you want to get into more kind of scary materials like resins and stuff like that, then you then you have to learn a little bit about what's safe to breathe and what's not safe to breathe. And yeah, and, and, and those are that's one where you really it's always best to find a little tutelage for stuff like that. Okay. Working with Instacast, which are urethane resins that cast very fast, um, they're incredibly, you know, silicones are are pretty easy to use as long as you're using best practices with them and silicones are totally innocuous you can breathe that stuff all day long urethanes you can gain a sensitivity you can you can get a sensitivity to urethane resins and to epoxy resins uh and i've worked with people who have that and it, it's it's compromised their their standard of life yeah um i i work with a breath mask here in the shop when i'm doing when i'm working with some of the some of the more dangerous materials but again there's tons of stuff online for that there's i mean if you start searching it, it Instructables has some really good, robust technique description of using basic casting materials. Um, and it's really good to go to a place you trust like that because they're, you know, it's there's a lot of companies that sell casting resins and sometimes their signal to noise ratio. Oh, actually, now that I think about it, I'm sorry, Smooth On, mm-hmm. who's one of the major makers of casting materials, resins, and all of that stuff, has some fantastic tutorials on their website. I, oh, I've been meaning to mention this because 
it really is stunning uh, uh, instruction on a step-by-step basis about how to make certain kinds of molds, how to cast in them. And if you really follow those directions carefully, you're using great materials and they will not steer you wrong. I mean, is there a rule of thumb about where you need to start looking for information before? Is it any time you're dealing with like an epoxy situation where you have two chemicals that come together and something happens? Or is it is it just, you know, consult? Is there, there's, a, there's books, I know. That you yeah. get like the paint store that tell you what to use where and when and where you, when you need a respirator and all that kind of stuff. You but know, this is something I never I've never done, so I don't really yeah, know about. Yeah, you know, in general, in general, if you're just doing your hobby stuff, the the your basic precautions of a standard NIOSH filter and rubber gloves are going to suffice for pretty much everything you really need to do. Okay. Um, if you're getting into more like production line stuff, you're going to want to wear a bunny suit and you know have sequester part of your shop so that you can clean up the dust and you're not breathing it in all the time. But, uh, it, it, but we're not machining beryllium. We're at not most machining shops. beryllium and we're not creating, you know, like 500 of something. Yeah. This is really like home hobbyists working with small amounts of the material at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard it, on that level. It's hard to get into tr- too much trouble, too much trouble. Cool. Um, let's see. We talked about screws before when we talked about, when we talked about your sorties, sortimos. Yes. Um, but I mean, where else do you, where else do you go to? I mean, it seems like, like I, I walk around here and I look at stuff and I'm like, oh yeah, I can see why you would use that. I can see why you would use that. I can see. And, it, and it's all like, there's trays of batteries and screws and, and divots. And is there, I mean, any place in particular that you go to find that kind of stuff that's well, not maybe immediately obvious? You got to figure out what you, what you need mm-hmm. and you got to figure out how you work. That's one of the key things. And that's one of the tricky parts for a young maker is that you don't know how, you don't know what you don't know. So you have preferred materials that you like to work right, with. Right, but and so when, when, and like when I do. say things like I've spent a lot, I invest in the best of a tool, the trick is what, why would you do that unless you know that you need that tool? Right. So how do you know that you need that tool? The trick is I bought a really cheap Chinese version at a swap meet or a flea market, <laughs> and I tried it out, and it turned out to be something I really liked. So then I did invest $150 in the excellent version of or it. Or like the lathe. I mean, you know that you are proficient with the lathe, and you right. use it a lot, and anything that you can put on a spindle in turn... You're, that's going to be one of your preferred ways to carve material off so, of it, right? So on that front, you know, flea markets and places like Harbor Freight are great warehouses for getting your first tool of the, uh, your first of a tool. Right. If you're not sure if you need a, a pneumatic powered riveter, buy one at Harbor Freight. They're like 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. If it turns out to be key to you, go to Granger and spend 150. Because I tell you, I own both and the one at Granger <laughs> is phenomenal. But you, if you're not going to use it, there's no need to invest in it. And the stuff you can get at flea markets is, is so much less expensive. I mean, it's pennies on the dollar comparatively that it really is worth it to try it out. Well, and the, and the other thing is that, uh, sorry, Norm, oh, no, uh, yeah. there are hacker spaces and things like that in most major cities now, at least Detroit, New York, and Chicago, and San Francisco yeah. um, that I'm aware of, yeah. where you can join, join, become a member, whether it's something like Tepchak that's a real business or just a just a ha- maker space. Yeah. And there was nothing like that when I was starting yeah. out. I mean, we were just looking for garbage day in various neighborhoods and going to trash pick, you know, other people's electronics hardware. I think you'd probably... I get arrested if you did that now. Really? I, 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 almost I, got, I, I almost got arrested once. We were down in Brisbane in this industrial park at four in the morning going through some scrap wood that was by this dumpster. And these cops pulled up and they were they were very friendly. They were very Brisbane friendly. Brisbane cops are very nice. But they said, don't do this here. Yeah. We don't have anything else to do. Go to San Francisco. They got a lot of other crap on their minds. They won't bother with you. <laughs> well, and four o'clock in the morning may not be the least suspicious time of the day. It's the do most that. fun time. To go well, it makes you, you you feel like you're getting away with something. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, that's fantastic. Anything else to add before we wrap up? I think I think we hit a lot of high points here. You know, the the thing is, is a lot of my advice comes from the fact that I started out looking for stuff and getting inexpensive tools and learning how to use them before there was an internet. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the early '90s, and there. Really wasn't anything, and where normal people weren't on it at right. least. Yeah, and so I bought books and I looked at techniques and books, and I learned which ones worked and which ones didn't. I learned uh, also by asking people who knew how to do it, and mm. I, I I've never been afraid to ask to ask how to do something, you know, and that is a a, a really great key skill to get um, when you're working at a new place. Like if, and I'm always. I'm always promoting that theater is where you get to learn how to build everything. Mm-hmm. And if you're in theater and you're working and you're on an entry level, but you want to try something, tell somebody, I'd really like to try to build something like that. 
And then if they need help on the weekend, they may call you in. And if you're pretty good, they're going to call you in again. And if you're pretty good at that, the next time you tell them you'd like to try something, you get to try that. I mean, that's I spent six years doing that in every effects shop I worked in. A good set of extra hands is always is always good to have. Um, estate sales too. Check estate watch sales estate, are estate great. sales. Garage sales. Garage sales are fantastic. New York City is a great trash picking city. San Francisco is one of the ultimate garage sale cities yeah. in the world. I mean, you can hit you can hit two dozen garage sales on a Saturday morning easy if you're fast. Absolutely. And you find such a weird variety of stuff here from from like art that you would hang on the wall that you'll pay $3 for all the way down to like metalworking tools Absolutely. and random weird Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. I picked up a whole portions of my shop back when I was starting out at, at garage sales. Uh, some, you know, somebody's dad passed away and I got their compressor and table saw and yeah. chop saw. Um, Never buy a compressor full price. There's millions of them floating around and nobody <laughs> uses them. Exactly. Uh, Wait, I was going to add one last thing. What oh, was sorry. it? What was it? Um, oh, uh, back when I was first living in San Francisco, there was the Foothill College Ham Radio and Electronic Swap Meet, which then became the Moffett Field Electronic Swap Meet. And now it is, I think, the De Anza College Swap Meet. Okay. It has morphed. There's also a Livermore Swap Meet uh, once a month during the summer months. Both of those are fantastic places to get electronics, to get making supplies, get inexpensive tools, get really beat up but perfectly working versions of great tools and good advice too and terrific advice absolutely well fantastic thank you so much adam thanks Norm. Guys. we'll uh, see you guys next week with another episode of uh, still untitled all right see you guys later bye bye